If uh, you're reading ahead, I'd like to ask you, if you would, to read ahead and read chapter 15 for next week, which has to do with the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha are those documents that uh, some have purported uh, belong in the Bible when they actually do not. They're, they belong in the category of pseudepigrapha, many of them. Uh, that is, they were written uh, under a pseudonym, and those pseudonyms usually are famous Bible characters. So you'll, you'll, have, you'll have something called the uh, Acts of John. Well, John wasn't really the author, and I like what Lightfoot does, if I recall. He actually gives some illustrations of it. I think he prefaces it by saying, uh, you know, if you, if you ever have any doubt whether these books belong in the Bible, just go read some selections from them. And he talks about th- how ridiculous they are. One of them, I think it's the infancy narrative of Thomas. A little boy bumps his shoulder, and so Jesus goes over to him and strikes him dead. I mean, it's the most un-Jesus thing you could ever imagine. And you listen to, and in another one, I think it's the Acts of Paul. Paul baptizes a lion who turns around and saves his life later on. Uh, It's just the most ridiculous kind of stuff you've ever heard in your life. And so, anyway, uh, chapter 15 has to do with the Apocrypha. That'll be a good selection to read for next week. We're at that stage where I'd like to invite you to watch the movie God's Outlaw. It is available in full for free on YouTube. And I think it's a very, you know, talking to one person tonight who went and watched it last week, uh, said that it was almost like, you know, watching a movie where people were living under the regime of Nazi Germany, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, religious freedom. It was just brutal, brutal. We'll talk a little bit. I don't know if we'll get to that tonight, but we will uh, eventually. And we're also at a point where I'd like to recommend a couple of other books to you if you are so inclined or interested. And if you are, I can, rec- I can uh, remind you of these books after class uh, if you don't have time to write them down. But we're moving now into a phase where we're eventually going to be talking about Bible translations. And so I want to I just present three uh, books to you for your reading enjoyment If you have trouble falling asleep at night, these might be your books, but uh, one of them on the far left is called The English Bible from the King James to the NIV, A History and Evaluation by Jack P. Lewis. Jack P. Lewis uh, was one of uh, Harding's most distinguished professors, Harding University. He, along with Everett Ferguson and Hugo McCord, have been called uh, some of the greatest scholars that our our brotherhood's ever produced. Uh, Brother Lewis got his Ph.D. from Harvard. I want to say another place, too. Uh, I know he, he did graduate from our brotherhood schools as well, but I, I can't quite remember. But anyway, what he, he did. Thank you. That's, that's what I was trying to remember. So he went to Hebrew Union, which is actually not in existence anymore in its, its former form, uh, which is a tragedy. But Hebrew Union for many years was the elite school to go to for study of the Old Testament, what we would call the Old Testament. Anyway, yeah, he he graduated from Hebrew Union and Harvard. Long story short, very, very skilled in the biblical languages. And each chapter in that book on the far left uh, evaluates the strengths and weaknesses of every English Bible version, including places where it could be better and places where it's outstanding. And then the middle book is also by him, but it's more just a Q&A format. doesn't actually review every single version. And then on the right is a book called The King James Version Debate, A Plea for Realism by a man, an Oxford scholar by the name of D.A. Carson. Carson's not a member of our brotherhood. However, he is a very well-read conservative Christian. And uh, what he does in this book is he deals with a particular viewpoint about the Bible He's very, very respectful of the King James Version, which I really appreciate. And at the same time, he refutes this position that is held within many denominations called King James Onlyism. And it has different versions of it. Some of them will only read a King James that was actually the first edition published in 1611 which uh, when we get to that section of our study where we talk about the King James and its beauty and its influence and all that, we're going to look at maybe a page of what the 1611 looked like. Good luck reading it. You know, if, that, if that's your view, 
I actually had a, a very good friend that I worked with at Lifeway many, many years ago. Um, before I was, uh, before I met Shelly even, uh, he, he had uh, gone to school at a place called Pensacola Bible College, down obviously in Pensacola, and it was a fundamentalist um, Baptist, Bible Baptist church, that's what it was, and they were King James only. And so he tried to tell me all the arguments about why that was the only version to use and all other versions, uh, including the new King James Bible were absolutely erroneous. And uh, anyway, this book deals with that, and it's, it's of interest if, if you have friends or somebody that, that falls in that category. Anyway, far left is probably your best uh, bet in evaluating versions. So what we've been doing up to this point in our study is we've been evaluating uh, evidence for support of our Bible. Uh, that goes to the region of Alexandria, the lar largest Jewish settlement, which... Uh, helped produce the Septuagint, the most important document in the early church because it was the Greek translation of the Old Testament, uh, and it is really the source of every New Testament quotation from the Old Testament. Most of those are word for word from the Septuagint. We talked about the influence of a man named Origen who uh, compiled all of the Hebrew Bible editions up to that point, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. We talked about the importance of uh, Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus. We did not talk about other important manuscripts. There's a lot of others we could have talked about. I do think there's a chapter devoted to some of those in the, uh, in the book. And we talked also about New Testament uh, quotes from letters of the first, <clears throat> first and second century Christians excuse me, as they wrote letters to each other. Uh, all that to say that um, you know, textual criticism is not something that you should be worried about in terms of you know, criticizing the Bible. <laughs> uh, you know, I had a, a student one time that was really angry because we were talking about textual criticism and said, we should never criticize the Bible. Well, that's not what that, that's not what that means. We're, crit we're not criticizing at all what God wrote. We're critically analyzing the scribes and their copying, and then tracing back from there to the original writings. And so we have very uh, deep confidence that what we have in our Bible uh, is accurate. Now, in terms of sections of Scripture, which uh, some people have argued for or against, is a very short list. And so the list really could be uh, encapsulated in that bottom left corner there. There's been some debate over the years about the longer ending of Mark, which is missing in Codex Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. However, Justin, uh, a 2nd century, writing in about 150 A.D., 2nd century writer, Christian writer, um, he quotes uh, verse 15 and 16 in one of his letters. So we know it was at least in, ex in existence in the 100s A.D., uh, so scholars get back and forth about that issue, but I, I don't think that one is that, that difficult. There's a, there's a line in John 5, which some people think was a scribal comment in the margin that over the years some copyist moved over. There is what is called the comma Johannium, which is the story of the woman caught in adultery. I don't know of any scholar who thinks that's not a true story about Jesus, uh, the question isn't that, it's the question is, is whether it belongs where it is in the text. And then really the only major verse that's ever brought up in the question is 1 John 5, a portion of verse 7, and there's a whole interesting history behind it. If you have a special request where you want us in class to analyze uh, the evidence for any of those, I'm happy to do it. Uh, so just let me know after class and we could lead out one of our studies with that. Um, but uh, anyway, just wanted you to know that's really, really the long list of uh, the short list of, of, of issues that have been brought up over the years. And so when we think about textual criticism, just kind of put a bow on this. God caused the writing of the original. They're called the autographa or the autograph. Uh, that's the original document. The copying of those documents was highly accurate. There were some human errors like misspellings of words. Um, 
dittography where they, you know, they repeat a word. You know, maybe they were writing the word, got distracted, came back, okay, and they rewrote the word again. Um, just things like that, uh, misspellings. But there are plenty of copies, as we've illustrated in, in our ridiculous uh, apple pie and other ways, to, to correct points of disagreement, and therefore we can infer with confidence the original. No important teaching of Scripture is on the line in any way about uh, any issue. And so we can live confidently by the instruction of Scripture. And we believe wholeheartedly both in the providence of God and making sure we have all, all those copies so we can do that. But also we believe in inspiration, which my teacher Harvey Floyd said is where all necessary truth is included and all error is excluded. All right, so now we're ready to talk about early Bible versions and just to kind of, I don't know, rehearse a little from the last session where we were together talking about um, history and the time right after the apostles. There arose a false teacher by the name of Marcion who lived from 85 AD to 160 AD. Uh, he was a false teacher. He belonged in the earliest uh, group of heretics known as the Gnostics. Have you ever heard of the, most of you have heard of the Gnostics before? They were sort of this charismatic group that believed that they had special revelation from God outside of Scripture that was telling God told, you ever, you ever dealt with anybody that says, God told me this or that? Well, they're the, kind of the original group within uh, the challenges of the early church that did that. And anyway, Marcion, he belonged to that group. And so there were some books of the Bible he rejected, others that he accepted. He accepted the book of Luke, but he had uh, cut out some of the sections. And then he accepted some of Paul's letters and nothing else from the New Testament. Well, this led to the writing of a document in 180 AD called the Muratorian Canon. Now, you hopefully read one of the chapters last week that had to do with the canon of Scripture. Scholars, who can tell us what the canon of Scripture is referring to? Oh, go on. Okay, yeah. Which books are valid uh, to be included within the Bible? Right, that's, that's the discussion. And so the canon of Scripture is that discussion. You know, what belongs in Scripture and what doesn't? And uh, I forget the chapter number we looked at. I think, it, was that 8 or was it uh, 14? Was it tw chapter 14, okay. Uh, anyway, so the canon of Scripture. Now here's the deal about the Muratorian canon. Everybody listen very carefully to what I'm about to tell you. They did not, not know what books belonged in the Bible until 180 A.D. when they wrote this document. That's not what that means. The Muratorian Canon was written in 180 A.D. as a reply to the false teacher Marcion. But everybody already knew for decades before Marcion which books belonged in the Bible. And that's important for us to know. People knew the minute Paul wrote a document, whether or not it had uh, it passed the test of apostolicity and whether or not it was accepted by the other uh, teachers of uh, the early church. Uh, they knew these things already. They were passing these documents around uh, from church to church. And so this is very important because, you know, we've seen over the years people have tried to make claims that the canon of Scripture wasn't decided until, wasn't it Dan Brown who made the ridiculous claim that it wasn't decided until the 400s? And he was actually referring to a council in the 300s and you know he looked at fourth century and thought that meant 400s and never mind it's, it's a big mess he, he muddied it all up but he was completely inaccurate and so from the earliest days the church knew exactly which books belonged there was really very little discussion uh, only a couple of books that were discussed as to whether they belonged or not and that primarily is because of their lack of circulation uh, amongst the early church. But what we did seem to happen uh, was a change in church leadership 
around the year 200, this starts developing. 200 A.D., so this is roughly 150 years. I'm just using broad numbers. After the time of the establishment of the church. 150 years later, we start having uh, changes in church leadership. Now, who has quick fingers and can read for us Philippians 1.1, which gives us in the very first chapter, the very first verse of the document of Philippians, uh, what church government is supposed to look like. Okay, so in Philippians 1.1, here is your outline of church government. Ready? Elders, deacons, all the saints. That's as simple as you could imagine, and it's, it's beautiful in its simplicity, right? You make it too complex, people are going to mess it up, and so keep it simple. The elders are your governing overseers. They make sure that Scripture is adhered unto, and they also make sure that uh, the flock is cared for. The deacons are those to whom the elders delegate responsibilities. And then the rest, the third category is what? All the saints. And saints is not some special category of somebody who's a better super Christian than everybody else. They're just the hagioi. That's another name for the holy ones. Another name for every Christian. Everybody in this room would be considered uh, by Paul, who wrote that, to be a saint. Now that was the early and original way to think about church government. But over time, things began to develop. From around 100 to 300 A.D., there was a slow change that took place. Uh, and I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but I have I've spoken at quite a few churches over the years, and from time to time I sit down with their elderships, and I just get to know them, or they want to get to know me, or you know, maybe one of my friends invited me there, so the elders want to talk to me or whatever. And so... Um, it's interesting, when you sit down with a group of elders, sometimes you come out of a meeting and you say, that's a, man, that's a cool group of guys, but that one guy, he's the one that gets stuff done, right? And, and you might joke about it. You say, oh, he's, he's the super elder or whatever. But there is no such thing, right? There's no hierarchy within elderships. Every single one of them uh, are to be equal. But what happened in the early church is you started having that very thing come about where you had various elderships, and one guy begins to rise to prominence as the overseer or the bishop. And it begins with one person over every church. But then over time, you started to have those who were not just over every church. They began to be over all the churches in a region, in an area, or in a city, right? And they also started taking on to themselves... Brian, I'd love to see you come to church one Sunday dressed like this guy. You know, they look around and they see you know, the Jews and their phylacteries. They look at some of the, the dress of the pagan priests, and they start dressing in some of this way, which is very anti the teaching of Jesus, in my opinion. And so the idea was these, these individuals started to take on greater authority. Uh, they adopted for themselves pomp uh, and... Um, I don't know, just, just the kind of thing I don't think belongs or is appropriate to the simplicity of the New Testament church. And so by the year 381, you end up with one patriarch over many uh, elders who have responsibility over cities, if that makes sense. Now, interestingly, during all this, most of the time, there's still a persecution against the early church. And so in 312, you have the edicts of toleration which are passed. And here's how that comes about. I'll tell you what it is in a second. But in 303, Diocletian makes a decision. He's going to gather up all Bibles of every different language and burn them. And he does so. And he uh, makes an engraving over the spot where he does it. And the engraving says the Christian religion is destroyed and the worship of the gods. Little g is restored. How'd that work out for Diocletian, uh, for, uh, Diocletian, by the way? Didn't work out very well. And um, he's the last, in fact, of the emperors who put Christians to death. Uh, the historian Galerius, uh, made, uh, roughly a contemporary, made this comment. It's a social comment 
on the day. It, it essentially said that the blood of the martyrs is becoming the seed of more Christians. So every time we kill one of these guys, two spring up in its place. Because why? Because they're being motivated by these deaths. Their faith is so strong. So Galerius said we can no longer put Christians to death. All we're doing is just expediting Christians to heroism. So that leads in the mid-300s to the rise of Constantine. Constantine decides that he's going to give, um, he's going to give the church a place at the table of government. Now, can I just tell you, this is a big development. And it has massive ramifications for a thousand years hereafter. Uh, I cannot tell you the number of times I've dealt with somebody who's, who's come to me and said, you know, the Christian day of worship was always Saturday until uh, Constantine came along and changed it to Sunday. No, we didn't. No, we didn't. You can look back in the right. You know, I mean, just the New Testament itself makes it very clear that the Lord's day was the first day of the week. But beyond that, you can look back at the writings of the first Christians and see that they were worshiping on the eighth day, they called it. Why did they call it the eighth day? Because they were trying to highlight it's the day after the seventh day, which was formerly uh, consecrated unto rest unto God in the Jewish religion. What Constantine did was he essentially took, uh, took Sunday and made it sort of a lesser national holiday. He's doing that to appease the many Christian converts he has living within Rome. And he does, he does a lot to try to make Christianity acceptable. So we're not talking about a very, you're talking about roughly about 30 to 40 years after the last emperor who was putting Christians to death. So this is, you know, it's just think in our own time, it'd be like back to the 1960s, people were putting Christians to death. But now, hey, you know, they, they're very influential in the government. This, is, this would be the way that it, they would think about it in terms of time. But I want you to think about it. The Roman emperor, starting with Constantine, now has influence, and in some places, especially in Rome, total control over the churches. May I suggest to you government being totally control over the uh, controlling over the churches is a disastrous idea. And in fact, if you have ever read the book of Revelation and the political ramifications of this very thing, it's ironic. Because the very things that the Apostle John was warning about with the rise of the beast, uh, which most scholars believe to be Emperor Nero, but the beast had many horns and indicating many... Uh, iterations of it. And so you have these Roman emperors talked about in the book of, of Revelation uh, who are seen as the ultimate bad guy. And now we're in the mid-300s, and guess what? The ultimate bad guy has the control, total control over the church in Rome. It's terrible. Human history would attest to that, by the way. But what we end up with shortly after Constantine is the rise of uh, a new bishop over Rome named Damasus. Damasus I, who begins to plant the seeds for what will 300 years later become what we know of as uh, Roman Catholicism. I mean, you can already see the seeds there, but he's actually the first guy, by the way, he's actually the first interpreter in history who takes Matthew 16, 15 as referring, as the rock referring to Peter. The early church didn't have a problem with it. Damasus comes along and says, oh, when, he, when Jesus says, I will build my church upon the rock, well, that interpretation traces back here to Damasus. He's laying a foundation for the power of the church of Rome. But during the time of Damasus, you have lots of Latin versions of the Bible that are floating about. Let me let me talk a little bit about Latin, because I know you're just dying to hear it, and you, some of you, your eyes are already fading, and I get it, but here we go, okay? And, and I want to encourage you to do your own study about the history of the Latin language. I'm relying on stuff I remember 15 years ago. I didn't have time to go back and look at this, but here's how I remember the development of the Latin language, okay? So before the time of Jesus, there is what is called 
Old Latin. And a lot of surviving, very important, powerful, influential documents, philosophy, um, are written in what's called Old Latin. By the time of Jesus, Greek supersedes Latin as the most important and widely used language in all the world. Why is your Bible, and why are all the manuscripts, for the most part, in Greek? It's because Alexander the Great conquered the entire known world, right? But Latin was still used in Rome and still used by Latin-speaking uh, people of origin, in, in, and, and they especially used it in government settings, okay? So what's the three languages in the inscription in John 19 above Jesus? What languages are they in? Right? Hebrew, Greek, and? And then, what do we end up with? Well, Latin continues to float around, but, but its strength is primarily still in Rome. And by the time we get to Damasus, you have all of these, it's really just people you know, out of here, there, no concentrated effort, but they're, they're trying to take the Bible and they're trying to write out a version of it in Latin because that's what they're most familiar with, some of these pockets. And um, now just to kind of press ahead in history, just in case your eyes aren't fully closed, okay, uh, after the 300s, Latin begins to die down in its use and importance. And in the 700s, there is a very influential figure by the name of Charlemagne who comes along and essentially rescues Latin from dying out completely. And that includes most of its history. But what, what Charlemagne does is he's, es, he's essentially responsible for making Latin the language of the Roman Catholic Church. Now the problem with that is the Roman Catholicism uses Latin in everything, but the common person is forgetting more and more Latin. So by the year 1000, the priesthood has an iron grip on the Bible and the common person can't read it anymore. And that's going to lead to some of the issues that we have. Now, that's a period that would technically be called romanticized Latin or something like that. I forget, but anyway. So what Damasus does is he wants for these Latin-speaking, reading Christians to have a great Bible that they can, they can read. So he commissions a man by the name of Jerome. Did, did, did any of you read the chapter that included... Was that six that had to do with uh, Jerome? I think it was six or eight. Maybe it's eight. Where he talks, where it talks about the Latin versions. And Jerome had really, man, what an incredible life this guy. He's basically an ascetic, which means he goes and lives off by himself in a monastery. He didn't ever want to interact with people that much, right? But he started out as a pagan. He had what he thought was a near-death experience and converted to Christianity, and dedicated the rest of his life to living in isolation and seclusion for the most part, studying the Scriptures. What sets Jerome apart is that Jerome is an expert in Greek. So when he decides to write out a new Latin translation, he, instead of looking at the former Latin versions, he goes directly back to the Greek text and goes from Latin, I'm sorry, to Greek, to Latin. Okay, that's very important. Nobody really had done that. And so what he does is he produces the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in a new Latin format. And then, over time, he decides, I'm going to also write out the Old Testament, which he does. But to do so, and I, I really respect Jerome for this, Jerome actually goes and attaches himself to some uh, Syrian nomads who were well known to have you know, competency in, in the old Hebrew. And he learns Hebrew so that he can do a better job. And he actually translates through part of it. He's dissatisfied as his Hebrew knowledge grows. And he goes back and redoes all of it because his skills are better. I, mean, I highly uh, respect Jerome for this. But he received tons of criticism. And so he undertakes this task in roughly 382 A.D. People, immediate, some very influential teachers, by the way, immediately are very against his new Latin version. One of them is a man by the name of Augustine, or Augustine, who is a, an elder and a very influential Bible teacher in northern Africa around this time. 
Augustine is essentially responsible for our modern versions of Calvinism. And at the same, so if you've ever, if you have any friends in a Presbyterian church or uh, come from what is called a Reformed theology background, uh, they can trace a lot of their interpretations back, you know, predestination, that particular view of predestination, all of that kind of thing, irresistible grace, that traces back to a guy by the name of Augustine around 400 A.D., but he was incredibly, inf- probably the most influential writer in this time. Augustine thought Jerome's Latin Bible was awful. And in fact, he thought the Septuagint, which is what? What is the Septuagint again? Greek translation of the Old Testament. He thought that was inspired. Which cannot be sustained any more than in the denominations those who say the 1611 King James is inspired. It can't be sustained. He he had that same view back then of the Septuagint. And so he's got a lot of very influential people against him, but he's a scholar, okay? And, and he has wealthy Roman aristocrats who are helping him behind the scenes, funding him to stay in a monastery and work tirelessly. And so by 390, he translates the Hebrew Bible from the original Hebrew, completes all of his work around 405, And it becomes known as the Latin Vulgate. And it's called the Latin Vulgate because, uh, is it Vulgita? I forget the actual Latin word, but essentially vulgar means common, you know, for them. So what does he produce? let's Let's put our thinking caps on. What has he produced in Latin if it's called the common Bible, common language Bible? What's he produced? A readable Latin translation. And that was his task. Now, um, Jerome is, in my opinion, a very interesting uh, character who had very good intentions. And his work has led to roughly about 10,000 copies of the Western text type that survives to us down to this time. What's important about uh, Jerome's work is that more copies were made of his his Latin work than than any other translation that was ever made, that's ever been made. And so that's helpful from a couple of different standpoints. Um, It it helps us in terms of, you know, at least going back to his era and finding out what the original autographs said. But between the 5th and 15th centuries, most church services and public Bible readings were performed in the Latin language and performed from the Latin Vulgate. Now that's great in the beginning when everybody knows Latin. But as I said, just giving you that little boring history, which has put about half the crew to sleep tonight, but as time progresses and people know less and less Latin, what's happening? you got a bunch of guys dressed in these... Weird outfits getting up in front of you and they're saying a whole bunch of stuff that you have no idea what they're saying. You can't even go to the text yourself and read it for yourself. You have to trust them to tell you what it means and to interpret it. Well, guess what? Now there's a power play involved. And the Roman government is involved. And a lot of these guys become, uh, man, just actually very evil people who are masquerading as priests in the name of God. I know nothing like that has ever happened in our modern age. I'm being facetious. Well, what this leads to then is as Latin begins to die out, there are English efforts for a readable Bible. What's really, I think what's what's interesting to me about this is that a lot of the surrounding areas, I'm going to center in on, England for just a second, okay? So, I don't know how many of you watched God's Outlaw. That is going to be a movie set in the 1500s. So that movie is set way down the line from where we are right now in our discussion. But we'll get there pretty quickly. But I'm bringing that up because in most of the surrounding nations around England, most of them by that time have produced a Bible in their own language. Because everybody, you know, every common person knew that it, 
It wasn't fair. It wasn't right that the church had it in Latin, but nobody could read it, and we couldn't read it for ourselves. All these nations, they all have it. England, getting an English Bible was a bloody, bloody affair. And so if you watch the movie at the very beginning, you got, was it the little girl quoting the Lord's Prayer and they put, his dad, put her dad to death. You know? Because to own an English Bible was equated to heresy. And heresy was a death penalty. So, a number of attempts were made from 500 to 1300 to create an English Bible. Uh, Cademan was an early British monk in the late 600s who paraphrased parts of the Bible, not really translated it. Bede from uh, the late 600s translated the Apostles' Creed and the model prayer of Jesus. I don't know if you'd count that. you got basically one section of Scripture there. About 1000 A.D., you have Elfric, an archbishop, whatever that is, of Canterbury, translates part of the Bible into English, and he said, Happy is he then who reads the Scriptures if he convert the words into action. But we're going to fast forward now to around 13... Let's pause. Just looking at that list, is that a very... Um, What's the word I'm searching for? Does that seem sparse to you? Just imagine the time frame we're talking. We're talking about 500 to 1300 with an increasing every century, an increasing awareness we need God's word and we can't get it. What a sp and, and more and more power being drawn unto itself by the church. It's really brutal uh, in terms of spiritual health and the possible spiritual growth of, of any group of people. And that is what makes John Wycliffe in the 1300s an incredibly important figure. Wycliffe produced the first translation of the whole Bible into English. He copied it by hand it gets done around 1380 A.D. So just imagine, you have the Latin Vulgate in power, but it's roughly not readable from the mid-500s for most people. And here we are in 1380, we finally get a Bible in English. It's in something called Middle English. How many of you ever took a, uh, I think I talked to somebody about this after class last week. Did any of you ever take an English class and you had to read a book called Beowulf? What do you remember about Beowulf? By the way, hang on a minute. Of those of you who read Beowulf, how many of you used uh, Cliff's Notes? Yeah, may I ask, why did you use Cliff's Notes? Whoever Cliff was, he's an awesome guy, right? I mean, it's, it says it's in English, right? Shouldn't we be able to read it? Well, English in their day was very different. Actually, English from Wycliffe's time to Shakespeare's time is very different. And I think primarily the, the evolution of lang the English language has a lot to do with the publishing of various versions of the Bible during that short span of time, which we'll talk about here in a bit. Yeah. So Wycliffe, uh, Wycliffe looked around at the power the church was wielding for itself, looked at the priests, <laughs> and how they were living their lives uh, in immorality. I mean, these are the guys who give us God's Word, and yet they're going out and they're the most immoral people in our city. You think about that. So Wycliffe uh, learns of a practice that's happening. The Roman church is trying to fund the building of St. Peter's Basilica, which still stands, by the way, in Rome. And they're trying to get money to build it. So do you know what they do? They go around from village to village, town to town. Yeah, and, it, and they, do, they in, institute something called the sales of indulgences. So they come to... Uh, they come to a man's farm, 
His wife has just passed away. And John Tetzel is the leader of this, the guy in charge of this particular movement of the sale of indulgences. And Tetzel goes to the older man who's now a widower and says, you know, your loving wife, faithful as she was to the Roman church, she is currently residing in purgatory. And I want you to know that the sound of the coins hitting the inside of the donation box are also the sounds of the gates of purgatory releasing her into everlasting paradise. Well, for a large majority, uh, the masses who were totally influenced by Roman Catholicism, that worked. I mean, have you seen St. Peter's Peter's Basilica? But among a lot of scholastics like John Wycliffe and people with common sense, that was offensive. And Wycliffe wrote a book against this practice called on, O-N, or about, simony. The name Simon with a Y on the back of it as a practice. On simony. Does anybody have any guess what the reference is? In, uh, that's exactly it. Acts chapter 8, Simon the sorcerer wanted to buy the power of God with money. And Peter condemned him for it. And so the book is titled On Simony because Wycliffe was saying what the church is doing right now is the exact same thing Simon the Sorcerer tried to do. Now, how do you think the Roman church took that? Not well. Here is a copy of Wycliffe's uh, writing. I tried to zoom in to the lower right-hand corner of that left-hand page. I've tried uh, over the years to try to read some of that. I can only make out some words uh, in the really larger print. Uh, There ends ye prologue, and then it says something, something ye gospel of, and that's that's God. It it looks like 1,000, but it's God. So if you were to look at a Tyndale, I'm sorry, a Wycliffe Bible today, uh, it's, it's very different even though it's in English. Um, Wycliffe's interesting. 1384, he made a, an argument, an appeal before the church that the scriptures were the only authority for Christianity. What a novel idea. What a novel idea. He claimed that the papacy was unhistorical. Hmm. What does that mean? That there's no historical or scriptural basis for a pope. So how did the church react? Well, 1401, they passed the anti-Wycliffe statute, uh, extending persecution to Wycliffe and all of his followers. If you were caught with a Wycliffe Bible, you get included with that. The Constitutions of Oxford were passed in 1408 where they basically got together and said, you know what, Wycliffe's wrong, we've got all the power. Let's pass that into law, as if it changed anything, right? It didn't. The Council of Constance in 1415 declared Wycliffe a heretic, officially. And so he was buried at that time on sacred ground. They dug his body up burned it, and put the ashes in the river so that he wouldn't be buried on sacred ground, which was, is another of their ridiculous notions. Yeah. That's it. And you know they were so mad they didn't get to do it in real life. You know, but while he was still living, they would have loved to have done it. I didn't mean to cut you off, but I did. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you hit the nail on the head. The real motivation behind their anger is what? The threat to their control. The 
a threat to their power. They have to be seeing it. Wycliffe is called the morning star of scholasticism, the Enlightenment, and the Reformation. So he's sort of a new dawn rising of rebellion against Roman Catholicism's power at this time. And from here, uh, next week, we will pick up from here, we will uh, look at next guy in line. Who might that be? Well, a fellow by the name of William Tyndale, who was incredibly influential. And uh, so if you haven't watched God's Outlaw on YouTube, I encourage you to do so. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we, I would argue that through God's providence, we owe a debt of gratitude through John Wycliffe. Uh, because he is sort of that spear tip of a movement that would eventually lead to us having a Bible in our laps tonight. So, okay. Let's close out with, uh, with a word of prayer tonight. Father, we thank you for the preservation of your word. We also thank you for uh, the ability to learn lessons from history, how they uh, open our eyes uh, to a human being's instinct to wield power and even to wield your word as a source of power for themselves. We thank you for rending that power from their hands and giving it back to the people. And we thank you we can read our Bibles tonight and we can know the truth. And if we don't know it, we have no one to blame but ourselves for not reading it. We thank you for that. We pray tonight as we leave this place that we'll live with confidence that you are with us and that your word sustains us and helps us to endure. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray it. Amen.